Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brabber and alongside me is Logan Camden and we've got a bunch of wonderful NBA basketball to talk about today. The NBA Cup started yesterday, we're going to be touching on that among other things, but we will start with the game of the night, Logan, which was yes, an NBA Cup game, which was fun, but more importantly, the return of Klay Thompson to the Bay Area to face his former Golden State Warriors. Awesome game between the Mavs and the Dubs. Golden State comes out on top. They improved to 9-2 and two now, Logan. Over the last four games, they've beaten Boston. They've beaten OKC. Both those teams did have injuries, but good wins on the road. And they beat Dallas here. How impressed were you by the Warriors in this game? I was very impressed, man. And it starts with Steph Curry. He's still a bad, bad man. Oh, yeah. He's a bad man, Majama. Like, that was one of the big questions, I think, about the Warriors coming into this season, right? It was how they were going to place Klay Thompson. Would they make any real move to add a, another superstar? But one of the big questions was about, about Stephen Curry and was he going to return to form? You know, a lot of people thought maybe we had seen some signs of regression during the stretch last season, and I didn't put too much water into that. I thought during the Olympics, I thought we saw a little bit of a bounce back in those final two games, and you know, it's the end of the year. I, I thought we'd see Steph bounce back in a big way, and I still think he's one of the – I still think he's a top-10 player. I think he's in the handful of guys you want closing out basketball games. I don't think he's number one. Number one to me is still Jokic. I think he's the best player on the planet. Like, we've seen him also emphatically slam doors in teams' faces. We've also seen him fight oh, yeah. back from big deficits in the fourth quarter. He's number one to me, but – Steph's still one of the most dangerous. In this game, he comes up with 37 points, 9 assists, 14 of 27 from the field, 5 of 12 from deep. But specifically, when we're looking at how he closed out the game, I mean, he's still the most dangerous player coming off of a screen in this sport, Carson. This team was down 7 with 4 minutes to go. They were trailing by 4 with 2 minutes to go. And he was unequivocally the best player in this game, not to mention in the fourth quarter. Breaks off Quentin Grimes into a mid-range jumper. Follows that up by lacing a three off a screen. Then you get the one where he drives to the rack with the butter finger roll, rejects the screen. Luca opens the gate. He gets downhill, head fake to the corner, easy bucket at the rim. And then the final one is just classic Steph. Gets that switch with Derek Lively. It's, it's art, man. Makes Lively go right. And once Lively... Because that's all Steph is trying to do. He's trying to fake lively enough that he's driving to the rim so he can create enough space, right? Because that's still not an easy shot. Even for a guy with a quick trigger like Steph, who is the best shooter with a sliver of space in league history, all he's trying to do is get lively to fake that he's going to drive on him. Once lively's momentum goes in that direction, slams on the brakes, drains a three, he literally just needs a, I mean, a paperclip-like window and he bangs it, and he slams the door in this one, man. I believe in Steph, but I also believe in the rest of this team, too, dude. Draymond Green is a defensive weapon. He comes up with a big clutch block on Daniel Gafford in this game. And we've been saying this the, the past couple episodes, but the defense is so well connected. Right now, mm -hmm. they're number four in defensive rating. They're number three in opponent field goal percentage. They're number four in steals per game. And I really like their personnel, Carson. It's not just Draymond, who is still one of the best defensive players on the planet, really switchable, really good rim protector. But Andrew Wiggins has returned to form on that end where he's taking pride where all with Luka, I mean, he's, don't get me wrong, man, Luka's going to have a possession where he's just going to make a tough shot over you. But Wiggins has given you great defense all night. Gary Payton II is a weapon on that end. Jonathan Kuminga isn't the most consistent guy on that end, but I thought gave you good minutes last night. And Moses Moody is a good defender. And they just fly up and down the court. Uh, and they're super deep. Dude, they flashed up a, a stat during the broadcast last night that kind of blew me away, man. I knew the bench was good. I didn't know they were this good. They're averaging 59.6 bench points per game. That's the most bench points per game through the first 10 games of any team in the last 50 years. Crazy. They're deep as hell. The defense is anchored by Draymond, and they've got really good personnel on that end. The offense is led out by Steph, and they're really deep there. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think it's a really crowded class below the Thunder in the Nuggets, but the Warriors are near the top of that group, man. I'm super impressed. They're deep, and they're really solid on both ends of the floor. And again, man, there's just something that I get with an Oklahoma City, with a Golden State, even with a Denver. 
they are playing Phoenix up to this point. They're playing so together, so mm-hmm. connected. Everybody's on the same page. I'm buying into Golden State. Now, like we always say with Golden State, and I hate always getting back to this dead end when it comes to them, I still think they need a move to make a move to move up into another tier of contender, but they're right there in the mix, man, right below Oklahoma City and Denver for me. And uh, last last game was another statement win against a very good team. I know Dallas has been underwhelming to start this season just record-wise. That's a very good basketball yeah. team, and that's a really good win. This team is awesome. Man, and we've talked about the same few key things throughout the year. You put this kind of defense in athleticism, and you put this kind of shooting, and you put this kind of depth around Steph Curry and Draymond Green, and you're going to have a really good basketball team. And I think that I underestimated how outstanding the depth of this team really was. I liked it, but like, it is game-changing. Every single night you're getting tremendous production from multiple guys in terms of these role players, right? Who did we see last night? De'Anthony Melton back out there on the floor. Such a good all-around basketball player. Brings his shooting, his playmaking, his athleticism, his length on the defensive end. Trace Jackson Davis and Kevon Looney combined for 14 offensive rebounds. Kevon Looney, man, God bless him. He has his limitations. He is not athletic. He is not skilled. He is not a vertical spacer. He is not an actual floor spacer. He is not a rim protector. And he is still an impactful basketball player when he is on the floor because he is so damn smart. He is so committed to impacting winning. He is so comfortable in this system. And he is just one of the best, specifically offensive rebounders in basketball. So that's what you're getting night after night from these guys. And Andrew Wiggins, we've talked about all year, has been better. Jonathan Kaminga is better with the bench unit. But really, this game was about Steph Curry and Draymond Green both looking shockingly close to the peaks of their respective powers in late 2024 man this is a version of Steph that we've gotten over the last two games that we didn't get in the home stretch of last season and I do think a lot of people overreacted to that we had to deal with some Steph Brunson conversations this offseason I thought that was silly but also I can't say that I wasn't concerned because I thought that He did wear down and he did regress, right? Post All-Star break last year, he was like 23 points per game on 57% true shooting, but he's playing at a different level right now. The last two games have just been unbelievable. The shot making down the stretch in this game was unreal, but now on the season, he's giving you 24 points, six and a half assists a night on 65% true shooting in just 29 minutes per game on a minute to minute basis. I mean, that is like peak Steph Curry production and efficiency. And the most important thing to me is that the Warriors continue to keep his minutes and his overall offensive load lower than last year, right? Not to say that he has to play 29 minutes per game all year, but to not let things get to the point where it's like, oh my God, Steph has to be the hero every single night in a game like this, in a game like OKC, when these are gotta have it games and you need everything Steph can give you, yeah, play him 36 minutes a night. Let him do this superhuman stuff. But I absolutely believe that the load that he had last year wore him down, was a big factor in why he did take a step back as the year progressed. But this Steph Curry that we're seeing is still a top three offensive player on the planet. Jokic is in a tier of his own right now. I still take Luka. Then I take this Steph Curry over everybody else because the impact is so monstrous. We talked about last year, that weird-ass Warriors offense, still an 82nd percentile offensive unit with Steph on the floor. This year, they're a 97th percentile group offensively when he's out there. They're 13 points per 100 possessions better, but they do have more around him. They have more shooting around him. They have a bunch of dudes who are bought into this system, who are moving without the ball, and the depth alone is just such a weapon. But Steph was phenomenal. And Draymond Green, dude, I mean, you mentioned the monstrous block on Gafford, but that was in a sequence of possessions in which he just destroyed the game. You start from the possession where there's like three minutes, 20 seconds left, takes a charge on Gafford, forces a turnover. Then he blocks him at the rim on the next possession. Then he pressures Gafford on a catch on a pass that was thrown a little too far out in front, forces a turnover there. Then he's pressuring Lively as he's trying to just like execute a handoff, if I remember correctly, like 30 feet away from the basket, almost forces a turnover there. This is Draymond Green at his most destructive, at his most brilliant. He had five stocks last night, and he is undoubtedly still the smartest and the most versatile defensive player on the planet. He is the best captain of a defense 
that we have seen easily more, in the last 15 years. More versatile than Bam, you'd say. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, I think when you're talking about the ability to actually take on perimeter matchups, I absolutely think so. Like, this more, is a dude who is such a high-level perimeter defender, is such an exceptional back-end help defender, and is just everywhere dude he is everywhere he has the best anticipation in the sport wherever you need him oh, as yeah. a helper I he is there before he's got to be there so he was my defensive player of the year in 2023 dude and he didn't get a ton of buzz for the award but the difference that we saw between a warriors defense that was best in the league when he was on the floor and was like 20 something when he was off it Draymond was still operating very close to the peak of his powers that season. I thought he took a little step back last year. I thought he wasn't as effective as a rim protector, but the level we're seeing this year is unbelievable. He has been more effective as a rim protector. He's anchoring what has been a top three defense in basketball. And the dude's one of the five best defenders in NBA history. I go Bill Russell. I go Akeem. I go Tim Duncan. I go KG. Then I go Draymond Green. I think that he is a one-of-a-kind genius, a one-of-a-kind versatile weapon, and he is still doing it. The guy was drafted in 2012, man. He's going to be 35 years old later this season. And that's just what is so remarkable to me about this Steph and Draymond run. Last year wasn't the best season for the team overall, but as their respective anchors, they have remained towards the apex of the sport on each side of the ball, respectively. In 2022, that wasn't supposed to be a team that could win the title, right? Guys around them performed really well, Poole and Wiggins, but Steph and Draymond were the anchors. They were completely what made that sort of run possible when already by that age, right? Once your guys are in your early 30s, mid 30s, even in Steph's case, like your window's supposed to be closed and they won a title because of those two basketball players. And I do hope not to make this an anti-clay thing at all, but now that you see them on opposite sides, that this solidifies that Draymond has always been the second most important part of this dynasty. As the defensive anchor, obviously Clay is a far, far better offensive player, but what Draymond does bring as a facilitator offensively is still so important here. But it's really about having your all-time offensive anchor, your all-time defensive anchor. That's what's always made this dynasty what it's been. That's what still makes the Warriors a great team. As awesome as the peripheral guys around them are and have been, and they are the difference between this year and last year, we're also getting even better versions of Steph and Draymond. And the one last area that I want to give Draymond credit, since the start of last season, dude, Draymond Green is 67 of 166 from three. That's over 40% from deep on two and a half attempts a night. Outside of 2015 and 2016, this is the best he's ever shot from beyond the arc, easily. And I'm not cringing when Draymond puts up a three. I'm like, okay, man, your shot's falling. He's taking more of them than he has in many years. So I do think like that makes him a more functional offensive player here as well. Dubs are really good, man. And I think if they continue to prove that in this recent stretch, the Cavs game, they got shellacked. That said more about Cleveland to me. Right now, this is just a very good playoff team. I am with you. I would like to see an upgrade in terms of high-end talent if they want to be true contenders, as we talked about just last show. But this is a really, really good team. This is a team that I do think has a Western Conference final ceiling that after OKC and it's here their own, I still think Denver's the second best team in the West. The Warriors really could be the third, man. I think that there's a crowded group there, as you said, but I just absolutely love what we're seeing in terms of the connectedness, in terms of the shooting, in terms of the defense, the level we're getting from Steph and Dre. It's been so much fun to watch. Yeah, and I do, I don't know who would argue that Clay was the, that kind of surprises me that people a lot of people that, was, that was number two. Oh my god i mean i would say that for a long portion of their tenure together with the warriors most people said that clay was their second best player and i think that that started to change and trend in draymond's direction but i still think it's closer to 50 50 than it should be because it's really not close in my opinion no i mean draymond's a pillar dude and even like like last night, watching the guy switch on to Luka, he's probably one of the best guys that can defend him. Also, while still being on the floor, the best guy that can match up with Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively. It's, Dude, when he skied for that block, Draymond's got like... Dude, Draymond still has that sneaky athleticism, man. Cause, he's got that 7-3 wingspan. Dude, anytime he rises up to like block a shot, I'm like, oh no, this is not going to... You know, I'm like thinking this is not going to end well right before it, and then boom, he blows something up. He's... He's a unicorn, man. Like, he really is one-on-one, man. And when we're talking about, like, the smartest basketball players ever, I'm glad you mentioned that, dude. Where 
position wise, I don't know if there's ever been anybody better. Like the the blocked three he has, uh, I think it's I'm in glad. the first half. I mean, he's camped in the lane, anticipates the pass right mm-hmm. as it's coming out, sprints out there, no hesitation, sticks his hand up, stuffs it, and then saves the ball. You know, gets in layup and transit. Ridiculous transi- play. It, it's it's remarkable, remarkable stuff, man. And. I did like the tribute. I thought it was really cool. Everybody rocking captain's hats for Clay, Very man. Cool. That was dope. That was a really cool return. And Clay played a Clay played a good game. I got to give him props for that as well. But yeah, he forced up some rough shots, but he also made some impressive shots. Also, Steph, I thought played Steph played pretty good defense on him when they were matched up too, man. Mm-hmm. I uh, I was impressed with that. But it's that remarkable, personal, man. Dude. I'm glad that they've that they've kept this thing together for so long, and I'm glad that they saw a vision that I didn't see. Not that I think – I don't think you could ever blow these guys up. When you're looking at someone who has been so long – these are two of the longest tenured guys in one franchise in the NBA today, man, right? Like, Steph is the longest, and then Dre's definitely – is Dre the second? I'm trying to think about who might – I think Dre's the second now that Clay's gone. Yeah, I mean, you can't ever blow that up, but I, I just wasn't as – encouraged that they were going to be this good through the start of this i never i didn't see this i mean i had them winning i had this as a 500 team out west man and it's a lot of dog it's a lot of effort but when you have these pillars on offense and when you got this pillar on defense man anything feels possible with this group dude and again it's a lot of other things too dude wiggins returning to form because that was such a big swing variable but buddy healed is better than clay thompson that's not a hot take man he just works better here it's the deepest team they've had it would take a lot. It would definitely still take a move at the deadline for them to be moved into championship contention, but I can see a Western Conference Finals run, and I didn't see that before the season began, man. I'm I'm legitimately moved, dude. This is a— Oh, 100%. It's, it's an awesome Warriors team, dude, and Steph is— Steph still got it, man. He's the one that makes a secret sauce work. I think that you have to be moved. I don't know how you could not be. Like, this team is really, really good. They are significantly better than I— you i think most people expected and it's just a joy to watch it's incredibly fun to see these two dudes in particular at their age still doing this but everything around them clicking is also such a joy do you think draymond's a top five defender of all time do you think that that's too high do you think that's just right who'd you you had duncan you had kg who are the other guys russell and akeem who i think are the locks is top two i wouldn't really hear anybody else out oh also one, I agree. Yeah, I think when you look at his versatility, the only guy I, I was surprised that wasn't there, and maybe this makes sense because he's a perimeter defender. You wouldn't have Scotty in your top five. Do you think he's a top ten guy? Like, where does yeah, Scottie I would have Scotty top this? ten. I just think, to me, the best defender ever, who isn't like a true big in terms of size, is Draymond. Even though he functionally and, is a big as a help defender, but like he can also do the perimeter stuff. Then I would go Rodman. Yeah. Then I would go Scotty. Those would be okay. my top three, like non true big defenders. The last guy I wanted to bring up when you were talking about active players, because I know you made a push for him in the off season. So you think Draymond at this point in his career is even more versatile than Evan Mobley in your opinion? Yeah, I think that what makes Mobley so special is that. He's a big who can guard like a wing and can take on a Paolo Boncaro, take on a Jason Tatum, and is also like a tier one rim protector. But I just think what Draymond is still capable of doing on the perimeter is at a different level. And so I think there's a very strong case that Mobley is the more impactful defender because rim protection is the most important thing. As great as Draymond is as a rim protector, Mobley is better. But in terms of just, like, that sheer versatility, I think Draymond's number one. I think he's been number one. I don't think that he's ever seeded that title. And the reason I have him above Scotty, just to give some further context there, is because of the difference in terms of interior defense and rim protection. And also just, like, Draymond being a -a one-of-a-kind defensive mind. Like, Scotty was a good rim-protecting wing. He is as good a pure perimeter man defender as we've ever seen. He was also a guy who wreaked havoc in passing lanes, forced a ton of turnovers. Scotty was awesome. But, like, the aspect of truly being the captain of a defense on the back line like Draymond, it's just the most valuable thing that you can be. And he's the only dude who's ever been that at the level that he is at six foot five, dude. And while being able to guard on the perimeter like he can, Draymond is just such a freak and he has still got it. 
How about the flip side of this matchup, Logan? I know that you talked a little bit about how Dallas is a very good team despite their record. Are you concerned at all about them starting five and six? I'm not, and here's why. One, I think when you look at their schedule, they've lost to good teams. And all of their yeah. – like, and their schedule's been pretty tough. Like, they've also beat up on bad teams, right? They crush the Magic. I'm not saying the Magic are bad, right? But with Paolo's injury, it's like – good they should steamroll orlando yeah they mow down the bulls right they got a good win against minnesota they beat utah and san antonio their losses have been to the phoenix suns twice the rockets the pacers the nuggets and now the dubs all six of their losses they've lost six games by 31 points in their last four games they've lost by 13 points so i mean literally in like all of those games especially the nuggets and the warriors lost and the suns Two possessions go a different way, boom, you win those games, right? So they haven't been any egregiously bad losses. And the biggest thing to me is that Luka Doncic isn't playing anywhere close to his peak. He's not giving you yeah. – and people are always going to look at the numbers. You can watch the highlights with Luka. They're not going to tell the whole story. Sure, he's 29 points, he's 8 rebounds, he's 8 assists. He's shooting 42% from the field, 32% from deep, and 53% uh, true shooting. He needs to get downhill more. We talk about this a lot with Luka and sometimes him settling for perimeter jumpers. 15% of his shots are coming at the rim. That's the lowest mark of his career. He's also attempting seven free throws a game. And you may go, well, seven's not a bad number. It's not a bad number, but it's the lowest mark for Luka since his rookie campaign. 48% of Luka's shots are coming from the mid-range. That's also the highest mark of his career where he's only shooting 36%. He's also shooting 31% on above-the-break threes and pull-up threes, and he's shooting 27% on step-backs overall and 25% on step-back threes. So what I'm saying is, is that Luka has just a really tough shot diet right now. He's really inefficient, and he's been bad defensively. So your star player is not playing to his, uh, up to his apex. Also, the Dallas rotation is down some key contributors right now. P.J. Washington has missed four games with a sprained right knee. Dante Exum, who... You know, I think it's a good rotation piece here. He's out for three months. Uh, he had surgery on his right wrist. He hasn't been back. And the bench has been really bad. Dinwiddie's been horrible. Jaden Hardy's been horrible. Quentin Grimes has been pretty bad. So I I'm ultimately, I'm, I'm not encouraged by this stretch, but I think things are going to get better for Dallas. Uh, yeah. The defense has been good with P.J. Washington and Najee Marshall when they're available. You still have Lively and Gafford who give you a really strong baseline of your defense. They haven't fallen off a cliff there. And the most encouraging thing to me is that Kyrie Irving is playing some of the best basketball of his career. Right now, he's giving you 25 points and five assists tonight on 55% from the field, 54% from deep, Unreal. and 66% true shooting. And another big thing that swings in their favor is that Klay Thompson works here in Dallas. The offense has gotten legitimately better with Klay. So, to me, the biggest problem with Dallas is... Luka is, is their biggest problem. He hasn't been playing like the Luka Doncic we know and love. Mm -hmm. Their schedule's been pretty tough, and they're missing some guys in the rotation. Like, And the West is tough, man. Like, oh, yeah. I, I think at the end of this season, for teams that may start slow out of the gates right now, and this doesn't apply to, like, New Orleans. I think we're going to watch New Orleans crater with all of their injuries. But for teams hovering around 500 in the West, we're going to see some damn good teams in the Western Conference that are 42 and 40 at the end of this year, that are 44 and 38, right? I don't know where Dallas is going to end up. I don't know if Dallas is going to end up near 44 wins or if they're going to end up closer to 50, but we're going to have some damn good teams on both of those ends. So, no, man, I think once Dallas gets fully healthy, once Luka plays back into form, I, Luka's the guy I've been most disappointed in, man. Settling for jump shots, his body language, his temperament, his... Shot selection, a lot of that has been my biggest issue with this team. And I trust Luka. I think he's going to play himself back into form. And I think this team is going to figure out, more importantly, at full health, I think this team is better than last year. And they just went to the NBA Finals. So I'm not saying that I'm expecting them to go back to the NBA Finals, but I right. think at full strength, when playoffs come around, they're going to be better than last year. The record's not great, but I think the Mavericks are going to be just fine. I agree. I'm not concerned right now. They're actually still 11th in offensive rating and 11th in defensive rating. You mentioned the injuries. You mentioned the losses to good teams. It's not just losses to really good teams, dude. I mean, they've lost three straight games to Phoenix, 9-2, and two, Denver, 7-3, and three, 
hotter than anybody other than Cleveland basketball right now. And the Warriors, also 9-2, and two, by six combined points. And this was a team that was amazing in the clutch last year because of the shot making they got from Luke and Kyrie there, because of the level they defended at in clutch situations, and they've just struggled there early the year. Luka hasn't been good by his standards. You mentioned the percentages, 53% true shooting. Also, like a couple of these games have come down to a possession or two, and he has taken a couple bad shots in the clutch. In the Denver game, when Kyrie was as hot as I've seen any player all season putting on like one of those all-time shot-making displays that I feel like I will remember for my life, and Luka jacks up a 30-footer, like that was a really bad shot in the final minute of that game. You kind of have to put up a tough shot, right? You have to get to a step back three somehow in this Warriors game to tie it up, but he didn't really create any separation on Wiggins. That was a really tough shot. When we're talking about this small a sample size, when we're talking about games that are this close against good teams, that stuff matters in terms of their record. doesn't matter in terms of how I view the Mavericks long term. I mean, you're talking about their win total. I still think that they're probably going to win 50 games. They could win more than that. And I said when we were talking about the Warriors that they could be the third best team in the West. I want to be clear. I want to be specific. Today, I would probably still take Dallas as my third team in the West. I don't think I've been moved off of that. But I think the Warriors are close enough to where, like, it's arguable. It's close. I did the same thing where, like, I tweeted out the other day, the Cavs very well may be the third best team in basketball, which I think they very well might be. Today, though, if I were to compare them to Denver, who do I truly trust more in a playoff setting? I would probably still lean Denver. So just because I'm saying something could be the case doesn't mean I'm saying it is the case definitively. I still really like this Mavs formula. And to me, what's been encouraging is that they've been pretty good defensively. And that was the question about this team. But the injuries are real, right? With the depth guys and PJ's missed a few games now. Lively missed a few games. Then he just came back. I don't think you mentioned Maxi Kleba, Logan, because you detest him. But Maxi Kleba is a good bench piece specifically valuable because of the front court depth that he brings here I wasn't as high on Dallas as the consensus I don't think in the preseason because I saw people who were like yeah it's Dallas and OKC for the West and I was like whoa OKC is way better then I would go Denver then I would go Dallas but I had them as a clear third I would still have them third today I think if anything you're happy with how Najee Marshall has looked. He's been good. You're happy with how you've defended. Lively's a little better than last year, has been a little more involved as a playmaker. The depth, when you're healthy, I do think is legitimately good. There's no big red flags. Luka plays better. He was also bad defensively in the home stretch of last night. And you're good. And you know that Luka's going to play a lot better going forward. So I think the Mavericks are a very good basketball team and somebody who I really have very few questions about in the scheme of things. Logan, shall we talk about the team that uh, beat Dallas in a nail biter though, before the Warriors did the same thing? And should we talk about specifically the man who gave them 37, 18 and 15, that being Nikola Jokic, who is now putting up numbers that we've never seen in the history of this sport. And, uh, we just talked about him last show, too, and the ridiculous level that he's playing at. And I just did a video about him, but man, you can't talk basketball right now without talking Nikola Jokic. Logan, is he currently having the greatest offensive season in NBA history? I think so. I think so. I mean, at this pace, at this point, like, I, I couldn't argue anybody else. He's the total package. Right now, 13 points, 14 boards, 11 assists. The numbers are ridiculous. 56% from the field, 56% from three, nearly 67% true shooting. Right now he's fourth in points per game. He's number one in rebounds per game. He's number one in assists per game. And on decent volume, he's number one in three-point percentage. It is potentially the greatest offensive peak in NBA history when you are combining the best scorer and best playmaker in basketball. And I think that's the bar. And I know I've asked you this a few times on the show before, Carson, but like how many guys – can legitimately lay claim at one point in time they were the best playmaker and scorer in basketball. How long do you think that list is? I think that Jokic is the guy with the clearest, strongest claim to the throne. I think that you could argue it for LeBron at his peak. I think that you could try to argue it for Oscar Robertson, and I think that that's where the list ends. That's what I'm talking about. Like, and I know you've had you've had this take. When did you call the Jokic the greatest offensive center ever? I mean, offensive Ooh, center was like what five that years was ago. 
That was in the 2020-2021 season. That mm. was midway through his first MVP season. I said he's the best offensive center. I've been saying he's the best offensive player ever in terms of peak now for the better part of a year, and I do feel that's the case, and I do feel this is the best he's ever been. And it's slowly, I think, permeating through to basketball fans. Like, I've, I've seen people go, damn, man, Jokic might be the offensive GOAT. Like, mm-hmm. people are finally coming around to it. And I think it is, man. When you look at other guys, it's like when I look at LeBron, and I think when people theorize LeBron, they may take issue with this, but it's like I just trust Jokic to hunt his shot at a easier – he can just get to his look easier. Like, LeBron, Jokic could never do what LeBron did, you know, pressuring the rim downhill like that, right? Because he's not. He just doesn't have that kind of burst, that explosiveness off the dribble – so it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing, but he can get to that look. He can get to that little baby hook, that little floater range from 10 feet and in at will because yeah. he's so strong and there's nobody that can physically match up with him. And and he has such amazing footwork on the low block. And again, you just look at the games and how defenses, that's what I would really gauge it on. It's like looking at the defensive looks that he faces on a night-to-night basis, everybody's throwing two people at him because you can't guard him in single coverage. It's barbecue chicken. It's like... I look at three other guys that I think are in the running, and please chime in, Carson, if you think that I'm, I'm shortchanging some guys. But uh, I thought about Shaq, and I would take Jokic over Shaq because of the playmaking edge. 100%. Steph, in Steph's gravity, it's really hard to quantify. But again, I would take Jokic because I think Jokic is a more impactful playmaker. And I think, again, Jokic can just get to his bread and butter looks easier. That's close. Yeah. Again, Steph's the greatest shooter ever. That's hard to really quantify. And then LeBron. And again, with LeBron, it's very, very close, but I just think Jokic can get to his looks easier. Yeah, I, I don't know, like Kareem at, at his apex? like. Well, I think that to me, you have to go MJ before you go to a Kareem. I think you go Magic, Larry. I think that Shaq is close. I still would take those other guys who I mentioned above him. I mean, what Shaq has is the unstoppable scoring and all of the massive attention that he draws and how that does enhance his teammates. But I do still think the top tier one guys have that combination of elite scoring and elite playmaking themselves. I mean, Shaq's like a top seven offensive player ever, but I just think the ability of Jokic to dissect you himself, no matter what, to not have a weakness like Shaq does where you send him to the line. He's a liability there. The lack of floor spacing, the Mm -hmm. lack of clutch offense that you get from Shaq compared to a Jokic. To me, that's been clear for, again, Five years, or this is the fifth season that Jokic has been clear of Shaq offensively, and I say that with tons of respect for Shaq, who I think had one of the five highest peaks overall in NBA history. But offensively, Jokic is definitely clear. Is Oscar in that group too? Oscar, I think, is top 10 offensively all time. But I've been saying that I think that Jokic is the best offensive player ever, and I do want to go a little bit more specifically with this season because that is the specific topic at hand, so we don't just have some of the same conversations. And there's a lot of numbers there that I think make it kind of inarguable that if he were to keep up this pace, it would be the best offensive season we've ever seen. He would be the first player ever to lead the league in both rebounds and assists if he were to keep that up. He's also fourth in the league in scoring. He is creating the most total points per game between his own scoring and assists that we have ever seen in NBA history, over 60 per game. He's on pace for the third best true shooting percentage ever in a 29 point per game scoring season. But if we count his own putbacks off of his misses as one scoring attempt, because for all intents and purposes, that's what it is, right? If you miss, but then immediately grab your own miss and put it right back up for a score, it's effectively one scoring attempt. You didn't cost your team anything. His effective true shooting percentage jumps to 71. So that would make him the comfortable, most efficient scorer at this volume ever. He's averaging the most assists we've ever seen from a 25 point per game scorer. So the scoring, playmaking volume and efficiency unmatched in history. Which I mean, it's only it's only matched really by like 23 Jokic. I mean, he had like damn near 71% true shooting right. that year too. Yeah, and that's not even with the adjustment for his own offensive rebounding, which, like, we can apply that adjustment universally. Jokic is just better at this than anybody else in the league by far. So the production, the volume, the efficiency, unmatched historically. 
Then you have some of the certain aspects where he's just completely without a peer. In the clutch, per 36 minutes, Jokic is averaging 40 and a half points on 70% true shooting. He's on pace to shatter the record for most clutch points in a season. Not per game, total clutch points. The Nuggets have played in a lot of clutch games, but he's been unbelievable in those situations. And I just think about the Raptors game. I think about the Nets game where it is like, okay, cool. We're down eight. How do we cut that to six? Oh, we go to a Jokic post-up. How do we cut that to four? Oh, we go to a Jokic post-up. How do we cut that to two? Like literally possession after possession it is the most unstoppable action in basketball. You leave him in single coverage, these are 65% shots from him as the strongest player in basketball with the best footwork in the post, with the best touch by far we've seen in the history of this sport. You double him, this is the greatest passer in the game today, a top two passer in NBA history who is right in the teeth of the defense, dotting up cutters, spotting shooters. It's offense that you don't have an answer for. And that one specific action is something that nobody else in history can replicate, right? In these clutch situations where teams are going to try to wall off the rim if you're somebody who attacks downhill where if you are a Steph Curry right you are susceptible to some of the variance that comes from operating around the three-point line you cannot directly impose yourself and say yeah I'm just going to get a great shot every single time it's something that sets Jokic apart and it's been more on display this year basically than ever before when we continue with the statistical case I don't like single number catch-all metrics Jokic is currently on pace, though, for the all-time single-season records in box plus minus and value over replacement player, which is just a ridiculous thing to point out. And then you look at the impact. You look at the difference that you see with his team when he is on the floor compared to off it. The Nuggets are 37 points per 100 possessions better with him on the floor. 37 points, Logan. That would be by far an all-time record. It's a small sample size, only 10 games. Take that with a grain of salt. But it certainly reflects the experience watching the game, and this is what Jokic does, right? I mean, this would be his third straight season with at least a plus 20 on-off differential. He would be the first player in history to do that. He and KG are the only guys to do that in back-to-back -back seasons, and I think that he is going to become the first guy to do it in three straight years. And this is the craziest stat of them all in relation to that. Cleaning the glass tracks your expected win-loss record with a guy on the floor compared to off it. This is a stat that I know you like as well. So... When Jokic is on the floor, the Nuggets play like a 68-win team. When Jokic is off the floor, the Nuggets play like a one-win team. It's a differential that I have never seen. I have never seen that sort of massive, unfathomable difference when a player's on the floor compared to off it. And that's basically all coming on the offensive end because their offense craters without him. We're talking like an 86 offensive rating, bro. Stuff that the Bill Russell Celtics were holding teams to in the 1960s, okay? 20-something points below what any actual NBA offense looks like in today's NBA. And with him on the floor, they're playing like the best offense ever in terms of their offensive rating. And that includes the fact that like Jokic has been shorthanded and he was without Jamal Murray. And now they've been without Aaron Gordon. Without Aaron Gordon, when Jokic is on the floor, they have a 132 offensive rating. That's 10 points better than any offense in NBA history. So I don't think we've ever seen an offensive player this great. I don't think we've ever seen this combination of just unbelievable volume production, being involved on every possession, but not doing so in a way where you're overly dominating the ball, right? He touches the ball 115 times a game, way more than anybody else, but he's 26th in terms of time of possession, right? He's incentivizing movement around him. He's spotting cutters quickly. He's making quick decisions, keeping the offense within flow, making everybody around him better. That's where you have this unbelievable efficiency, where he's one of a kind. You have this unprecedented impact on team offense. We've never seen anything like that. You watch every single night, the guy is in complete control of every possession. He's getting what he wants every time down the floor. He is making the team offense better by a wider margin than we've ever seen from anybody else. He's the best offensive player we've ever seen. You said it. He's the best scorer in the league. He's the best passer in the league. He's the best rebounder in the league. And that's not offensive specifically, but he's an unbelievable offensive rebounder. So I take him over anybody else, and I think that this is the craziest version of him that we've ever seen in the regular season. The 2023 playoff run I thought was the greatest offensive postseason ever, but just the relentless assertiveness dude, that we are getting from Jokic every single night, understanding my team needs even more from me than I've given them in my three MVP seasons and being able to give them that and to produce even better team results with instead of Aaron Gordon in there, now Peyton Watson, 
who is a very, very flawed offensive player and playing some more with these bench units and, and still producing great offensive results. It's the most unstoppable player we've ever seen. And you compare him, right? 2016 Steph, I feel like a lot of people will go to as like their greatest offensive season ever. And I understand that perspective. And I understand that like the constant gravity, right? The ceiling raising that you get having a Steph Curry in your offense without him even needing to touch the ball, having such a significant impact. But Jokic's ability to dictate every possession in a way where like, we're not talking about floor raising to really good offense, okay? We're talking about you put personnel around him that everybody was ragging on. Everybody was viewing as a red flag question mark and you're putting forth the best team offense ever. Like there isn't even a floor raising, ceiling raising dynamic there. It's just, wow, that's the best offensive player ever. And in these clutch situations, that's the best option you've ever had. When it comes down to just get us a great shot, mm -hmm. he's the best that we've ever seen. 2016 Steph, God, I love him. One of my favorite players ever. He struggled in the finals, right? He struggled with really physical defense. He struggled with mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of the three-point shooting variants, right? Not being able to physically impose himself on the game. He was banged up. I want to give him credit there. Not overly hold it against him. But we're talking about goats, though, bro. We're talking about the best of the best ever. This version of Jokic just feels invincible offensively. I mean, just to expand on that for a second, when I play, like, basketball, I always think about it percentages, right? I'll, I'd will i rather concede a mid-range pull-up jumper or a three-point shot to a shot at the rim inherently, right? I Think about, it like, if you were playing 2K or something, right, and you get the percentage above your, above your head. Oh, it was contested this much, right? So it inherently has X percent of chance to go in, right? Steph... His best look is going to be about a 40 to a 45% three-pointer, right? And that's about what it has a percent chance of going in. I get that if Steph's on a heater, maybe that number's a little higher. He's having a great game, right? It's at 50%. Uh, LeBron, getting downhill, getting to the rim, right? It's like a 70 to 80% look, right? Because it's at the rim. But like you said, there are counters to those things. There are things you can do defensively to run Steph off the line, to make that shot way harder. There are things you can do with LeBron with a head of steam piling up the paint and packing the paint mm -hmm. to deter him from that and to make that shot, the percentages of it go down, right? Where LeBron would maybe go down to 65 to 70%. Or Steph goes down to 40 to 45%. Jokic at will can spam a 65 to 70% look. And there's nothing you can do about it. I Like, that's how I look at it, man. It's like he can get such a high-quality look, and there's nothing you can do about it. And if you try something, guess what? He's got the counter to it where he can make every pass in the freaking book. He's a freaking Rubik's Cube, man. He's a... he's an, uh, Jokic is an anomaly, man. He's mm -hmm. an anomaly. Like, we've just... We've never seen this combination before, dude. It's... He's ridiculous. He's a ridiculous. Let me ask you this. It's way harder, I think, in this league with so much talent top to bottom. Like, do you think Jokic could be the greatest player ever? Like, period. Mm, no, I don't. I mean, to me, the two-way difference between him and LeBron and MJ and probably Kareem, too, will always be insurmountable. I think that Jokic is a solid defensive player. He's averaging almost three stocks a game. He's an elite defensive rebounder. He's an incredibly smart defensive player. He's second in the league in deflections. He how does a lot can, of positive things. How high it's can he just, get them? He's such a limited athlete. When you are a negative rim protector, which is what he is, you just can't be a super positive defensive center. And you can't be a super positive defensive player. And that's what MJ was. That's what LeBron was. That's what Kareem was. So that's why I say I think he can go as high as four. I think that, to me, number four in NBA history is Bill Russell, who is the greatest one-way giant ever, right? It's not to say he was a bad offensive player, but he's not an all-time great offensive player. He's not one of those, like, elite two-way guys, like the top three, but he's so clearly the greatest defensive player ever and by so far the most impactful defensive player ever. And I don't have time to get into that all right now, but... If you're somebody who isn't aware of why the Celtics won 11 titles in 13 years, it's because they were far and away the best defense every single year. They won numerous titles with well below average offenses. It was a different time in the league when being uh, that level of defensive force that Russell was, was possible. In any subsequent era of basketball, there couldn't have been such a singularly dominant defensive player. But that's what Russell was. So I kind of view Jokic has the potential opposite route in terms of being just the offensive goat 
and having an unrivaled offensive impact. And maybe he can get to number four because of that. Not in terms of leading to the same number of championships, right? It's a different league, but just being the GOAT on your side of the ball. Or like Magic, right? Who's in these same conversations. I think that there was a time when he was the offensive GOAT. I think that Jokic is a better offensive player now. So that's what I think the ceiling is. I think the peak he's operating at right now is probably just outside the top five all time overall because of the two-way edges that you give to a Shaq, the guys who I already mentioned. Wilt in 1967 would be in my top five peaks just when he totally maxed out his ability in terms of actually driving winning with his efficiency with his playmaking with his defense i think akeem is right in that mix i think russell is right in that mix right i think he's probably somewhere through like the sixth to eighth highest peak that we've ever seen but i think that he can climb really really high i just don't think that he can crack that top three unless you know we'll see maybe mm -hmm. i'm even underestimating him as the biggest Jokic believer on the planet for a long time it, right if he just wills his way to multiple more titles and sustains this level for another four years okay who knows what's possible then right that's just unbelievable I it's mean unfathomable he has stamped himself as the best player on the planet though I mean not even close I, I don't think it's a debate and I know we like this came up last year periodically We've held that for a long time, but I know last year it was, oh, it's SGA now, oh, it's Luka now, oh, Giannis has a case. Oh, Embiid, you know, people were arguing Embiid was better than Jokic, which was just always ridiculous to me, but he stamped as number one. Even close. Bro, I don't think we ever even mentioned the raw numbers. Maybe we should have done that. He's averaging 30, 14, and 12 no, on 67% for shooting. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Like, come on, bro. It's unbelievable. And uh, he has been carrying the team that everybody was panicking about. And it's just like, hey, it doesn't matter. I'm that much better than everybody else. Giannis, God bless him. I think he's amazing. Bucks are 3-8 and eight at the end of the day. I, I don't think that there is a group of NBA players you could put around Nikola Jokic and you'd be 3-8. and eight. Like, it's just that level of, hey, we're going to be a great offense no matter what. We've never seen anything like that. Enough Jokic. I'm sure everybody's had enough Jokic talk, but... I do think the gap right now between him and everybody else, a lot of people say it's the biggest since 2013, Braun versus the field. I saw our friend Jason just said that. Mm -hmm. I actually don't agree with that. I would probably say it's the biggest since 2018, Braun. I just think that the gap that entire time was massive. I don't think you ever could have seriously argued mm -hmm. anybody versus LeBron, even 2016 Steph, even KD in the 2014 to 2018 range. LeBron was, like, close to what Jokic is offensively, and although his defensive impact waxed and waned throughout those years, it still, to me, was significantly more positive in the moments when he wanted to be a plus defender at the very least. But you couldn't argue anybody else today. So it's two guys who I think are in a tier of their own versus their peers. LeBron, I think, is the GOAT. I just said recently, I think he's at a top two peak ever. Not putting Jokic in LeBron conversations. I'm just saying since LeBron, it's the biggest gap that we've seen. It's unbelievable. And uh, the Nuggets are clicking, man. They really are quite impressive right now. The Emirates NBA Cup is here. You can win big getting in on the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All 30 teams split into six groups every Tuesday and Friday, playing for the right to advance in the single elimination in-season tourney culminating in the NBA Cup Championship in Vegas. Get behind your favorite players and the prop bets you can make on DraftKings, the best place to bet NBA player props. Ready to place your first bet? Try betting on something simple like picking how many points your favorite player will have. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your pick. First time? Here's something special just for you. New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook. Every point counts. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code NERDS. That's code NERDS for new customers to get $200 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Let's talk about a team, Logan, that maybe hasn't been quite as impressive, that has been a little slow out of the gate. The 5-5 five and five New York Knicks. They got a win over Joel Embiid and the Sixers in the NBA Cup. And, of course, the big news of them for the offseason, while well, they added Mikel Bridges, they also added Carl Anthony Towns. 
10 games into the cat experiment, Logan, how do you think it's worked out so far for New York? I, I really do love the, the fluidity of the offense. I think Cat and Brunson are one of the best two-man offensive duos in the NBA today. Uh, the Knicks are number four in offensive rating. Cat right now is giving you 25 points on 51% from deep, 64% true shooting, and Brunson has given you 24 points and six assists tonight on 47-39 splits, 57% true shooting. These guys complement each other so well, man, it, in terms of, one, just the actions that you can run every single possession with these guys, if it's dribble handoffs or if it's pick and rolls, it's just easy offense. And I really just like the fact that, you know, last year in the playoffs, we saw Brunson driving into these forests, right? Hardenstein and Robinson camped in the lane. Those guys are only really effective near the basket. Robinson as a simple play finisher. Hardenstein, right, has his little touch shots from the mid-range and the short mid-range. Cat can kill you from anywhere, and Brunson is a guy that likes to work downhill and likes to get his back to the basket and just likes to continue attacking downhill, and they just complement each other so well. Uh, if it's Cat relocating back outside the perimeter and draining threes where he can just get hot. Again, he's shooting 51% from deep. I think that's Cat being on a heater, but I also think that's the Knicks generating a really high shot quality for Cat, right? He's shooting a lot of open ones, trailing uh, in transition. Uh, he's getting a lot of open looks. Uh, against the Bucks, right? They were just abusing Milwaukee. Uh, if it was Cat cutting to the basket off Brunson driving the lane, uh, if it was Cat going to work in isolation, the offense is really damn good, Carson. And it's a drastic identity change for New York because they were the gritty dog team who would grind you out and force you to outwork them in the playoffs. And it's kind of been flipped on its head. This is a team that's going to put up a lot of points. I, I like the complementary pieces. Ananobi and Bridges attacking closeouts. I do wonder if they, they should involve those guys in initial actions more. Uh, but Brunson and, and Cat are so good at, at the top. It's like it's just they're just going to create a good shot. And I like the I like the supporting cast that they have defensively around them. Uh, OG Bridges and Hart are really good perimeter defenders. OG and Bridges are two of the best wing defenders in basketball. And then Hart's been playing his ass off this year. It is going to be hard, I think, for this team to ever be really good defensively, though, just because they have two major defensive liabilities in Cat and Brunson. They're 19th in defensive rating right now, and the Knicks are 12 points worse with Cat defensively, with him on the floor than off. They have a defensive rating of 119.3 with Cat and a defensive rating of 107.1 without him. And that's where I was a couple weeks ago. I was, I guess, I, I've bought in a little bit more on this offense i really do think it's going to be one of the best uh, offenses in basketball cat oh, yeah. and brunson are so good together and also cat had a, a dime the other oh, night man did. a nasty one behind his head uh i think it was josh hart cutting because he was posted up and the 76ers were like resetting their defense and his back was to the basket and i was like oh shit man what's cat gonna do something stupid probably and then he throws Painful. this beautiful behind the back pass also, look, man, I like Cat, and Cat's really talented. He is still frustrating a little bit to watch, though, man, just because I hate how animated he gets cars, and I don't know if you feel this way, bro. Cat gets these, like, you, you've seen The Mask with Jim Carrey, right? I'm familiar with how he acts in it. Just like how cartoonish Cat gets with some of his reactions, like screaming at the refs and stuff, man. I God wish he could forbid a man in. have emotions. No, I mean, he definitely hits, like, the scream face a lot. Yeah, the— no, he's you know, definitely flabbergasted frequently, that's for sure. Also, just how, like, gangly he gets, like, when he headbutted Embiid, and he's good. He, I've, he's big Bambi to me. Cat is big Bambi, dude. He's a big baby deer, but he is really talented. I think the offense is going to be one of the best in the league. I need to see them with Mitchell Robinson and how the rotations look, right, because they are working shorthanded right now. I love Deuce McBride off the bench. He's a monster Deuce mm -hmm. is so good. I need to see them, though, with Robinson before I make final declarations. But the offense is everything it's cracked up to be. And Cat is skilled enough where I can overlook the the how animated he gets and how loud he can be and just how annoying Cat can be on the floor. It is really fun to watch. The offense never stops humming. And him and Brunson, I think, are among... Two of the best offensive-oriented uh, duos in basketball today. Oh, absolutely. 
I would say that the experiment's been fine so far. There's definitely been a lot of negative focus on Cat's defense, which I do understand, and there are issues I think there. It's, personally, I think it's a worthwhile sacrifice. I think so, too. I mean, it raises the ceiling of the team because offensively, it's a dream. And uh, also, it's like something that doesn't work as a direct comparison to last year because they don't have Mitchell Robinson healthy, who, like, is their defensive-minded center, right? So... We'll see how things look when he is on the floor. Offensively, it's been amazing. Cat's giving you 24 and a half a night on 65% true shooting. The spacing is just ideal for everybody operating in this offense. And I think that you see that just with how much cleaner the paints he's attacking are on his drives, right? One of the really tricky things for him operating in an offense with Rudy Gobert was having to drive into paints where Rudy Gobert and Rudy Gobert's defender were also planted. He averaged... 0.94 points per drive last year he's at 1.14 points per drive this year so significantly more efficient there obviously he brings the floor spacing from the perimeter he's been shooting the ball super well the Knicks don't shoot a ton of threes right none of their starters are super high volume three-point shooters so they're only 23rd in attempts but they're all good three-point shooters outside of Josh Hart but Josh Hart is okay he's below average but he gets hot sometimes and the other four are really good three-point shooters so they shoot them really well. Everybody's a threat to shoot the basketball. So it's a top five offense. I mean, I think that the skill is there. The results there right now, they're fourth in offensive rating. And it's not just about how Cat's performing individually. Everybody around him is thriving, basically. Josh Hart is thriving. OG is thriving. All these dudes in this five out offense with a ton of skill around them are just put in better positions to succeed. And their assist percentage is up from last year. This is never a like ball movement heavy offense, but... That is up from 29th to 21st. There's a lot to love on that side of the ball, and I think that's what gives them a special punch to throw, where outside of Boston, they're the best offense in the conference. I think Indiana has the chops to get there. Cleveland is number one right now, but I'm talking long-term. This, to me, is a top-two offense in the conference. The defense isn't great, though. I do think some of the panic has been a bit overplayed, and this is kind of unfair to do because this is a game that happened and like it should factor into their defensive rating. But I do think it's worth noting since the Boston game, since their season opener, just taking away that one game, their 10th in defensive rating. That game was such a disaster that it changes the numbers still up to this point, which does matter where they're 19th in defensive rating if you do include it. And I think it definitely set the tone for the lens through which this team is viewed. And I do think they have major issues when it comes to guarding Boston with both Cat and Jalen Brunson I mean, on the floor. That's major also, issues. That's also unfair, though, because, I mean, you're literally debuting two brand-new players to a team, right, with Bridges and Cat. It's like, it's it obviously is going to look uglier than it is because they yeah. just haven't played together. A team that also was, like, built to destroy you defensively no matter what, but then had one of the greatest three-point shooting performances ever. I mean, it was on pace to be the greatest before the bench went cold at the end. But Cat is not a good defensive big. He's a bad rim-protecting five. He's a bad drop defender. He makes mental errors out there. He does have positive traits. He's a good post defender. We saw that versus Embiid last night. He's a good rebounder. He mostly plays hard. I think that he's decent when you have him showing high, playing more of a high drop coverage than recovering instead of just a straight deep drop where he's really not an impactful defender. But I do think that I slightly overestimated how good their defense can be with him at the five. I think some people have been too negative about it, but I think that I was probably a little too encouraged by how Cat looked defensively in Minnesota. I never thought that he'd be even an average defensive big. Like, I thought that he would be a below average defensive big, but I thought you put really good perimeter defenders around him and you can be an above average defense. And I think that they have struggled to be that up to this point. I mean, they still have good perimeter personnel, but I think they are a mediocre defense right now. OG is unbelievable. I mean, OG is just like single handedly a lifesaver. But once they get Mitch back, that helps their defense in the non-cat minutes. That does give them a look with cat at the four, which I think they will deploy some. I don't think that they should start Mitch. I mean, personally, I would tra take the trade-off of sacrificing some defense to be that great offensively, which I think the Knicks are with cat at the five. But I think once you have Mitch out there just for 20 minutes a night with cat, without cat, then I think they should be an average, maybe even a slightly above average defense. And when you have this sort of offense, 
they're still absolutely a top three team in the East. Like, they can just throw that punch of being unstoppable offensively with all the skill on the floor, with two legit stars offensively and two really good complementary pieces, and Josh Hart is playing well offensively, and then they're solid defensively. That's not a bad formula versus everybody other than Boston. I love Cleveland. I think Cleveland is great. I love Kenny Atkinson. I love what Evan Mobley's doing. I love what Darius Garland's doing. I love uh, how their depth pieces are playing. I love Dean Wade. I love how they're playing on both sides of the ball. Cleveland is awesome. Still, if it came down to like, pick them versus New York in a series right now, but Mitchell Robinson is healthy, like that would be tough for me. So I, I still think that New York is definitely in that top three. And I get that it hasn't been the best start, but like it's not the most concerning start. You know, like Milwaukee's a dumpster fire, right? I don't feel that way at all about New York. I feel like things are just going to keep getting better for them. Not at all. And when we're looking at that matchup, uh, against Cleveland, right? Like, I could see Cleveland's offense going cold and New York just never stops coming, right? They just keep hitting big shots. The the final thing I wanted to add is just you were talking about offensively, Cat being able to drive clean paints, Jalen Brunson now being able to drive clean paints. It works around for everybody. OG Ananobi, when he's 100%. attacking a closeout, has nobody at the rim to challenge him when he takes on a defender. And that's even more pronounced because OJ is such a... Uh, OJ. OG is such Always a good mismatch mind. attacker. Um... You know, he's such a mismatch. He's so strong. And when he's got a smaller guy on him, there's just no resistance. And then Bridges, right? He's attacking clean paints. It, it just works around for everybody, man. And uh, I agree with you, dude. I, I think it is the – I think they meaningfully got better. And it sucks losing Hardenstein. It sucks that Mitchell Robinson is out of there. And your identity has changed. But I do – I think their ceiling's higher, right? The, the, cell, uh, oh, yeah. the Knicks – offense would just run out of gas late in games and every game in the playoffs was a rock fight and i'm not saying the knicks aren't going to play in a rock fight in these playoffs that just happens in some nba yeah. games right you just can't buy a shot it's going to be a lot harder for that offense to completely stall out and flatline than it was last year i don't anticipate that at all right is the engine going to be idling for a little bit yeah it, it might they might slow down a little bit but the engine I don't think it's ever going to stop running. No. You know, I don't think it's going to quit on you the way it did in last year's playoffs. And that's the appeal of getting Carl Anthony Towns. And I do think when Mitchell Robinson gets back, like you said, man, I wouldn't start them full bore, but stagger their minutes a little bit, give Robinson some run with the bench unit, let him anchor that team. And then in spots, and again, in certain matchups, maybe against other jumbo-sized teams, you deploy that look against them. The Knicks are two or three to me. And, uh... I think I also, I think I overreacted a little bit. I was really, really low on the defense. You know, I said that Cleveland was clearly going to be above them to me. I don't know if I could say that at full strength. It would. It also, I agree with you, it would be really hard for me to, to choose. I think right now I lean Cleveland, but that's a 50-50 series, man. I could really see that going either way. Yeah, and honestly, it might just come down to whose stars play better. But 100%. there's no question New York is better than the previous iterations we've seen. And... I've seen a lot of panic about the defense, and it's just like, guys, let's not ignore how much better the offense is, and that ultimately, like, there's just more talent on this team now, and depth is a major issue for this team, and you're without uh, one of your two crucial bench players, right? Like, I mean, I, all of that, to me, just indicates things are just going to keep getting better for New York, and Cat really has been amazing offensively. Unfortunately, Logan, we talk about the injury to Mitchell Robinson. There's bigger injury news around the NBA. Chet Holmgren is going to be out 8 to 10 weeks before he is evaluated for the Oklahoma City Thunder. That happened in the Warriors game. He fully missed their last game against the Clippers. How do you expect OKC to handle Chet's absence and to perform in Chet's absence? Well, it's not just Chet's absence. Not only are they down Chet, they're still down Isaiah Hardenstein. They're also down Jay Will, Jalen Williams. So, effectively, they have no real centers on the roster. I think the biggest guy on their roster right now is uh, Usman Diang, who's like 6'9", 6'10". But we saw it against the Clippers. They end up winning that one 134-127. They did get out-rebounded by 16 in that game, 45-29. They get out-rebounded on the offensive glass, 15-9. But I think Oklahoma City can – I think Oklahoma City's going to be all right. This is still a very yeah. disruptive and swarming defense. They forced 23 turnovers against the Clippers. 
They make you work all 94 feet. They apply insane ball pressure. This is still one of the most in sync and connected defenses in the NBA. They lead the NBA in defensive rating, again, but with Chet for the most part. Right. They also lead the NBA in steals per game. And right now, they've got four guys averaging over three deflections per game. Just havoc wreakers. Caruso, Kaysan Wallace, Jalen Williams, and Lou Dort. So what I think they're going to do, you run small ball, J-Dub at the five, and you just switch everything. Uh, apply a ton of ball pressure. You blitz entry passes and passing lanes. You front big men to make sure that they can't get that ball into the post easily. And you just make teams work for everything. I don't think they're going to blow any teams out. Like, I don't think we're going to see ass kickings the way we saw Oklahoma City destroy teams. But I could see them winning, you know, a lot of their games, even down Chet, as great as Chet is. And the matchups that I've highlighted to watch, because there's a lot of interesting battles. They've got Phoenix coming up, right? How do they battle against Yusuf Nurkic? He had 31 boards on Chet Holmgren last year with healthy Chet. How are they going to match up in that game? Dallas, right? you got to go up against Lively and Gafford. San Antonio, you've got Wemby. Portland, you've got two big guys in DeAndre Ayton and Donovan Klingon that you're going to get matched up against, but they are so good at pressuring the ball. They are so good at jumping passing lanes. They are so good at poking balls loose at just making little effort plays that swing games. Again, they forced 23 turnovers against L.A., I think they're going to be all right, Carson. It's not going to be pretty. I think they're probably going to get out-rebounded in every game. <laughs> and as a tenant to basketball, normally I say, if I'm struggling to pick a basketball game, I normally go with two factors, Carson. Who do I think is going to shoot better? And who do I think is going to rebound better? Because normally those things make a big difference in games. They still got the shooting edge over most teams. I don't think the rebounding component is going to be as big of a deal because of how great this collective defense is. So... I think they're going to be all right. I think the Thunder are going to be all right. Again, I don't think they're going to kick any team's ass the way they did with Chet, but I would be disappointed, even down Chet, if they won under 50% of the games in his absence. Oh, my God. Oh, dude. I'm going higher than that. I mean, What's I think number? they still might kick some asses. Really? I think they probably win, like, 70% of their games. That's ballsy. That's ballsy. Dude, I think that this team is just ridiculous, bro. Like... Chet is amazing. Nobody's higher on Chet than I am. I think he's clearly their second best player. I think the ceiling is the roof for him. And when he's been on the floor this year, the Thunder are outscoring teams by 17 points per 100 possessions. I mean, that's just unbelievable. When he's off the floor, though, they're still outscoring teams by 7.5 points per 100 possessions, right? That's still a very good basketball team. It's not astronomically great, but it's very good. And they're obviously losing something defensively. Like, they will take a step back. I think that you hit on all the keys, right? They have still tons of athleticism and length on the perimeter, and they'll blitz people, and they'll double in the post like crazy, and they live in passing lanes. They pester everybody. They're a turnover-forcing machine. But losing out on that rim protection, losing out on that rebounding, there's no way to make up for that. But offensively, I think that they're going to be great. Like, this offense is just insane, dude. And... They've been five out all year because they haven't played Hartenstein at all, but there's just so much ball handling. There's so much athleticism. There's so much shooting. With this configuration, especially because you don't have a Hartenstein on the floor yet, I think they still have more of those things than anybody other than Boston. They lead the league in drives per game. The spacing here is ridiculous, and they have the deepest group of quality perimeter players. In basketball, I think that the Warriors are definitely in that same conversation, maybe the Warriors literally go deeper, but like when you're talking about, hey, we're down Chet and Hartenstein, we still have Alex Caruso and Casey Wallace coming off of our bench, and we can just slide Aaron Wiggins and Isaiah Joe right into that starting lineup. AJ Mitchell has proven himself this year to be a solid rotation player already. Like, they just have a lot of answers, and they have a lot of talent, and they have a lot of perimeter skill on the roster. I think, obviously, they'll need more out of SGA and J-Dub now, and they got that last game, and J-Dub has been hooping as of late. SGA set a career high with 45. Alex Caruso has to play better on offense than he was with Chet out there, but he played better this past game. I do think he'll continue to do so. He just, like, hadn't been taking a lot of shots. He'd had a brutal start to the season from beyond the arc. I think that's only going to get better. I think they're still, like, a top-eight team, dude. 
And they will get Hartenstein back in a couple weeks, and that will be good for them because, like, they won't have to do this micro ball, Shazar biggest starter kind of thing. But they already survived a really tough matchup. I mean, you're talking about some of the bigs coming up. They already had to face Big Zoo, dude. And I wouldn't say that they held up particularly well in that matchup. I think that he killed them on the glass. He was very efficient. But they forced him into four turnovers, right? They bothered him off his catches. They limited him to 12 field goal attempts. And uh, that's a really, really good version of, like, the kind of nightmare matchup that they would have to deal with in the absence of any actual playable big. I just think they're so talented. I think that there's so much athleticism and perimeter skill and ability defensively that they're going to win games. I think they're still going to get the one seed, even with Hartenstein out now, even with Chet out for two months. I think they're that good. My only real concern with all of this, obviously it sucks for Chet, but he's going to be back, right? Unless things get really complicated and are worse than expected. He'll be back before the All-Star break or around the All-Star break, kind of worst case scenario. My only concern is just like having enough time for everything to gel now, because I do think you want to see them figure things out with Chet and Hartenstein, with those guys playing together. You want to figure out the minute stagger. You just want to get this group where there's a lot of continuity, but there's also some new pieces, particularly having two bigs like that you want to figure all that out. And a couple months is probably enough time to do that, but it's obviously not ideal when you hope to have a full season. I agree with that. I, I think that's probably the biggest question, Mark. That's ballsy, though. They're s still going to win the West. I mean, I just... I think so, man. I, I don't look at any other team out West and say that... They're just Oklahoma City's so damn deep still, man. Even with it's these crazy. injuries, like, yeah, I don't know if I'd pick anybody. I think Denver's going to have their up and downs this season with inconsistency from stars and, you know, them figuring out their fits. Phoenix, I think, is going to crater at some point, I would assume, right? I think this defense is just going to let them down in some games. Golden State, I think, is overachieving a little bit right now. I it's think if you trotted this team out, maybe saying they'd win 70% of their games, well, that's including Hartenstein. I don't think that's crazy. I think they can do that. But, like, this specific group they have right now, I think would be the wackiest 48-win team in the league. Like, I think it would be insane, right? You they never do it. build they a do team it. like this. I just think they're that good. I think that they could do that. I think it's a good take. I'm... I, I think I might be with you, though. I think they still I mean, might be my number one seed regardless. They had a brutal matchup with Zoo. He played well. The Clippers shot 54% from deep. Norman Powell went insane. And Derrick Jones Jr. went insane. And they, they still got havoc. a I mean, win. they just wreak havoc, team. man. 23 turnovers, dude. And they do that regularly. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Those thunder, It's a strong man. case, man. But I agree with you. I think for the... It's ideal that Hardenstein and Chet both get back in just so they can, you know, build chemistry, figure out... Just little yeah. stuff like that. It's always hard integrating new players in. Who would take the one seed? Like, if it weren't OKC, you were kind of running down why the contenders couldn't. But, like, that's the thing. I don't see another, like, 58-win team in the West. I mean, damn. At this point, I guess it's Denver, Golden State. I, I don't know. Like, Denver, I see maxing out at, like, 54, 53. I think there's only so much that Jokic can do by himself. And obviously he has Jamal and he has MPJ, but like I think there's just mm -hmm. a, a ceiling there because their depth isn't great. The bench is going to lose you some games. And Golden State's the next deepest team, but I still feel like there's a major regular season burden on Steph. Again, the Suns, I think, are a, a clunky team, and I think their defense is overachieving. I guess I'd pick Denver? Who yeah. would you pick? Yeah, I think that Denver makes sense to be the two seed. I mean, I think that you shouted out some good candidates. T-Wolves, Mavs, like... Those teams are off to slower starts. I don't think you could rule them out, but that's what I'm saying at the end of the day. Like, that's why I think OKC is still going to get the one seed. I think they're that much better than the field, and I think that they have really good answers to, like, every problem because they are so loaded with talent, such versatile talent. It's a great basketball team that they have built, and I think that in the West, like, they are in a class of their own. Not now, not without Chet and Hartenstein, but at full strength, I think that they are in a class of their own. 
nobody's better in terms of young teams than the Oklahoma City Thunder Logan. So it almost feels like they're just in a different tier right now, different conversations. We don't call them a young team anymore. They just are a tier one contender. But want to take this moment for each of us to give a shout out to a young core that has been impressing us as of late. Who would you like to shout out, Logan? I want to shout out the Atlanta Hawks, who were shorthanded the other night against the Boston Celtics, and they came out with a win, uh, 117 to 116. Now, first, I want to chastise the Celtics. This was a lazy-ass Celtics game. I thought they were careless and reckless with the basketball. This was a team that was asleep at the wheel. Like, and I'm going to give the Hawks some credit because a couple of guys played some phenomenal games. But as much as the Hawks won this one, I also thought the Celtics kind of just lost it. Carson, Atlanta shot 25 more times than Boston. They won the field goal attempts 100-75. to They won the offensive rebounding battle 20-6. to It basically is what decided the game. Uh, Onyeko Okongwu had an offensive rebound into a putback that put this one away. Um, and they traded possession. The Celtics missed a, a shot that could have won of them. But they basically lose this one on the offensive glass. Atlanta wins the rebounding battle by 11, 45 to 34. And they also forced the Celtics into 20 turnovers. So apathetic effort. I was disappointed by the Celtics, but two guys really, really impressed me. And the first one is Jalen Johnson, who uh, we have been longtime fans of here at Nerd Sesh. I I'm so impressed by his playmaking, and they've been doing more and more of this with Jalen, even with Trey Young out there. But he had to step up in Trey's absence as basically the de facto lead ball handler and playmaker. And this was a big appeal of Jalen Johnson's as a prospect back at Duke when we covered him when he was a very young man. He only played 13 games there, but he was a problem in transition. You saw the flashes of the handle, of the playmaking, and it's really awesome to see it fully realized because when you have a guy like Jalen Johnson that is 6'8", 6'9", he has phenomenal passing vision. He can just see over the top of defenses, and not only does he have the vision – he just has passing angles that other smaller players don't have. He can just make passes that smaller point guards, smaller ball handlers can't. And he's also really good at recognizing mismatches. Uh, Jalen was punishing Boston for their switch everything uh, scheme, right? If he got a big switch onto him, he is firing that ball to the post. If it's Big O, if it's Clint Capella, the Celtics were getting abused out of pick and roll, and a lot of it was just simple decision making from Jalen Johnson. Punishing, punishing them for putting a smaller defender on a big man or not rotating over quick enough. He's a really accurate passer, too. He's a good outlet passer. He really is, and I know you've said this on the show before, Carson, because we talked him up all last year during his most improved player campaign. Mm -hmm. He's a perfect complimentary wing, right? And the one big question about him was the shot. He's a good shooter, too. You know, um, I think his biggest appeal is the jumbo size ball handling and playmaking and the defense and the rebounding, but he's also a solid scorer, right? He can attack mismatches because he's a big, strong guy. He's athletic, but he can shoot the ball pretty well too. And then the other guy is Dyson Daniels. Oh my God, dude. Like, I just feel like the Pelicans lost that deal, right? I'm not a DeJounte Murray guy. I never have been. I didn't like the trade for New Orleans at the time, but now mm -hmm. that you couple in the fact that Dyson Daniels was – almost a throw-in, you know, a throwaway piece for New Orleans in that deal. Oh, we're getting big, bad DeJounte Murray. Dyson Daniels is a stud, dude. Right now, Dyson Daniels leads the NBA in steals per game with 3.6. He also leads the NBA in deflections per game with 7.6. Dude, he is disruptive. 6'7 and a half with a 6'11 wingspan. And what stands out on tape is Dyson is so aggressive but it's not reckless aggression. It's calculated aggression. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous, man. It's blitzing and catching guys napping when they're just dribbling in the middle of the floor with their back turned, and he's poking the ball loose. He's back-tapping ball handlers when they beat him off the dribble, and it's something that only he can do at this level because his wingspan is so long. Um, he's jumping passing lanes. He's straight-up stripping dudes. Like, Dyson Daniels is all defense right now. I oh, would yeah. wholeheartedly have him all defense first team mm -hmm. without a thought. He has six steals in this game. Sure, he gives the ball away. He has six turnovers in this one too, but he has six steals. And again, I think part of this is bad discipline from the Seas, but a part of this is just superhuman defensive playmaking that we see from Dyson Daniels night in, night out. 
wreaked havoc in that Nets game, wreaks havoc in this one. And now you're seeing uh, the offensive game that goes along with it. He puts up 28 points in this one, and he is killing Boston with his floater game. That was my favorite aspect of Dyson Daniels as a prospect, right, because I didn't love the outside shot. Mm -hmm. I didn't love him finishing at the rim, but I really did like the floater game. And he was killing Boston in the intermediate range out of pick and roll where they're just letting him take those shots. And he's buttering all of them. I mean, these guys look like building blocks, Carson. And Atlanta is the island of misfit toys. It's so weird what they've had going on there for so long. Paying Hunter and paying Capella. When I like Jalen Johnson more, when I like Dyson Daniels more, when I like Onyeka Okongwu yeah. more, when I like A.J. Griffin, when I like Kobe Bufkin, it's weird. But these guys look like building blocks. And, again, Boston played down to their competition. That's a component of this loss. But they won without Trey Young. The Atlanta Hawks should not win a single game without Trey Young. They should be shorthanded. They should be bad. They're not. Dyson Daniels and Jalen Johnson are studs, and so is Onyeka Okongwu. I'll give him a shout, man. I think Onyeka, he's a little bit undersized at the five spot, but he's positionally sound. He's a good shot blocker. He's a good rim runner, and, you know, he plays a simple role, but he does it as a high, at a high level, and he can uh, he can obliterate mismatches. Uh, so I don't know, man. I'm – and also, I think they had – I want to say they said this on the broadcast. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they might have had their career high in a – or career high. They're season Franchise? high in assists. Oh, season high. Oh, I, I think so. They had 35. <laughs> Ironically down Trey Young. Yeah. The Hawks have got some young studs, man. They really do. And Reese had his breakout game the other night, man. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really know what Atlanta's building, but they're building something down there right now, man. I, I really like a lot of these young Hawks, and I have for quite some time now. But Jalen Johnson and Dyson Daniels had monstrous games against Boston. Oh, the fellas got me fired up. I will say, you might have taken it a little far when you were listing names and we got down to A.J. Griffin, who has chosen to pursue Amen. the Lord instead well, of basketball. Well, I, I was just – the only reason I shouted out A.J. is because I really did like A.J. as a prospect. He was a, he was a good bucket getter. Unfortunately, he has stepped yeah. away to the game. I wish him his best in his spiritual and uh, religious journey, but I really liked A.J. as a prospect too. You know who I like a lot, Logan? Jalen Johnson. And I've always liked Jalen Johnson, but – the thing that stands out most with him is just how much he's being empowered to do. I mean, he's second in the league in touches to Nikola Jokic. He's running almost four times as much pick and roll as he did last year. He's giving you 19, 10, and 5. But it really is the playmaking at his size. I mean, some really impressive passes to rollers in this game. We've seen some impressive skip passes this year, kick out passes, like 6'9", really good athlete, good ball handler, good finisher around the rim, very good playmaker defensive skill set that is impressive versatile monster in transition good pick and roll finisher like dude just checks a lot of boxes and i think he's been checking a lot of boxes since last season but dyson daniels has surprised me way more i didn't like the Dejounte trade for new orleans either but i think it just grows more and more painful by the day i meant to mention dyson daniels when we were talking about most improved player on our last show, and I just forgot, but I think he's been in that conversation since the start of the year. I agree with you. He would be first-team all-defense right now. Just a monstrous perimeter defender. You mentioned how much he's averaging in terms of steals per game, like by far leading the league. Deflections, he's at 7.6. Second is Jokic at 4.5. The gap is huge. He is extremely ag- aggressive, extremely physical, has freakishly good hands unreal screen navigator he's always been an awesome defender that has been apparent his entire time in the league i do think it's been more impressive than ever this season and seeing him out there for 30 minutes a game it's just like holy shit this guy is a complete game changer on that end but really what i was out on with dyson daniels was his offense i was just like yeah this guy's a really good defensive player i don't know how much you can play him though because he's really limited offensively. I don't know if he can start for you because he's that limited offensively. And I don't know that I would say that Dyson Daniels is like a good offensive player right now. He had a really good offensive game. Still, the outside shot is brutal. The efficiency is really rough. The playmaking is solid. It's not great for a guard. It's definitely solid. 
But, I mean, this is clearly a significantly improved offensive player from where he was at. And the big thing, you mentioned the touch. I mean, he's 55% on floaters, more than three attempts a game. And I do think he's looked pretty good as a driver. The shot's an issue, but he is unequivocally improved enough and good enough offensively to where you have to have this dude on the floor for 30 minutes a night because of what he's doing on defense, which is just completely outstanding. So... I've been saying since the first game or two of the year, like, I think this Atlanta team could easily be better without DeJounte Murray. And they got draft capital on top of that. They got Larry Nance, who had a great game in this one. And uh, I saw our friend Jokic Joestar just uh, tweet about him potentially being an option for the Nuggets. I think he'd be fantastic for the Nuggets. So I feel for the Pelicans because their season is fucked and they might just be fucked, period, unless Zion can stay healthy. And obviously DeJounte hasn't been healthy, but... This is a really talented basketball player in Dyson Daniels. And I just love what you have around Trey now in Atlanta. Because, like, what are the key components that you've always needed? Defense. Athletes. Shooting, for sure. And that's not something that you're getting in spades from Jalen Johnson and Dyson Daniels. But the philosophy of getting these athletes, getting these defenders, talented defenders, you can throw Reese Oshie in that same mix with what he brings on the wings. I think that's the right approach. And I do like Onyeka a lot. So Trey can just do so much for you offensively. I think that he needs more help, but I think the defensive foundation they're building is a very good one. And I think that it was good of them to take a direction. It's obviously not ideal with Trey's timeline just because he is still ahead of the rest of the pace of this team, but like they're catching up and they're playing well. And I do want to shout out Atlanta as well because I like what they're doing right now and I, I kind of like them more without DeJounte at this very moment, which says a lot. I'm going to shout out a different team, Logan, that has really been uh, making their money on the defensive end. I'm going to give some love to the Houston Rockets and I am specifically going to talk about their defense because... I feel like there's this perception with the Rockets of like Jalen Green and Shengun being the cornerstone, being the strength of this team. Those are the guys they extended. Those are like the big name, big number young guys. I just don't think it's the case that those guys are the uh, true strength of this team. Houston is 7-4 and four right now. Jalen Green has been brutally inefficient and, frankly, just bad since the first handful of games where he was really hot shooting, 52% true shooting on the year for him now. Shangun has struggled this year offensively. He's under 18 a night on 53% true shooting. And they're still winning games because the strength of this team is 100% the insane athleticism around those guys in their defense. I think both those guys as offensive hubs are very talented but also very flawed, right? Shangun has never been an efficient scorer, and he's a non-floor spacer, and you just wonder, you know, what is the ceiling of an offense built around him? Jalen Green, the shot selection has been consistently atrocious, and that remains the case. He struggles mightily with efficiency and consistency. But the Rockets are third in defensive rating right now, and there's two dudes in terms of the young guys who I think deserve tons of credit there. Amen Thompson and Tari Eason. Per 36 minutes, Tari Eason is averaging 4.7 stocks per game right now, Logan. And these two combined for 13 stocks in their last game. I mean, there's just certain traits where both of them are exceptional. I think that Amen is one of already the best trailing pick and roll defenders in basketball, right? He's on your back and it, just his ability to make these plays from behind, right? To bring back pressure, to use his length, to just obliterate shots. It's unbelievable. And he's an elite rebounder uh, one of the best rebounding wings in basketball already Tari's hands are insane he's such a pickpocket and he's got a 7-2 wingspan like they're both just these insane athletes super long big wings diabolical competitors like high motor guys offensively they're good cutters they are problems in the open floor they run the floor hard in transition and they're just winners they just make winning impacts on the game with those two on the floor Houston has a 118 offensive rating and a 102 defensive rating, man. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's plus 16 net, and that's in 180-something minutes up to this point in the year. So you asked, last time we talked about the Rockets, if I thought a men should be starting over Dylan Brooks. And I said, well, I understand the perspective of wanting at least a floor spacer on the floor in Dylan Brooks. Not a good shooter, but a three-point shooter at least, which a men isn't at this point. But I do think there's a strong case that either one of these guys 
should be starting over either Brooks or Jabari Smith because Jabari Smith is struggling really significantly as a shooter right now. I'm not saying they have to do that, but I want to see both these guys playing more minutes because they get on the floor and they make positive shit happen. They are just wrecking balls. And uh, uh, again, Houston's been at their best with them on the floor. They're driving the strength of this team. And they're due to matter to the future of this team. And that's probably as good a case as any for starting one of these guys over Dylan Brooks. It's just like, hey, man, listen, we're investing in our future. And like the, the, the gap right now in impact does not exceed how important it is for us to get these dudes on the floor for 28, 30 minutes a night. And uh, it's just been good to see, dude. But I really think that group of wings that they are cultivating is super impressive and you know i love him man i've always loved him man i've said that he's their best asset but tari right now is better because of the fact that he actually can make shots offensively and he's better in the role i mean a man has a way higher ceiling and the thing with a man where i was like whoa is we saw the rockets go small no shangun for a long stretch against the warriors and in an actual five out offense where they're shooting all around and teams can't just like super aggressively help on a man. I mean, he's just getting to the rim at will one-on-one. -on -one, and that's such a special trait that he has because of his athleticism. And that's the thing, right? When I talk about Jalen Green, when I talk about Shangun, they're putting up the numbers. There are times where I don't want either one of them on the floor. And I would just rather have these dudes who are doing winning things. And that to me is the strength of this Houston young core. Yeah, I agree. I think that they get probably in... A disproportionate amount of credit it's it's the star thing like with orlando with everybody piling on paolo last year when it's built on the back of their defense and it's a similar concept here yeah but paolo's I, way better paolo's way 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 better than these dudes well i mean now but like even i mean yeah obviously i, I thought i think that goes without being said mm -hmm. but um yeah i think green and sangoon get overrated i agree with you they at least need like 25 plus minutes a night and I wouldn't mind starting Tari. Tari's a good enough shooter where I don't think you're losing yeah. anything with, with putting him out there over Dylan Brooks. And a man can just do stuff that nobody else on the planet can do. Like, I, you know, we always say that about a guy like Victor Wembanyama, and it's obvious because he's so tall and he's so long. My jaw dropped when I saw that highlight of a man chasing down uh, Bub Carrington in transition and getting that steal. Like, Bub has damn near half the floor advantage on him. Yeah. Like, not half, a quarter of the floor. That's a layup for 99% of possessions. But Amen Thompson's on the floor. Mm -hmm. And not only, it's not like it's a chase down block where Bub had a quarter of the court. He caught Bub before Bub was. Yeah. Bub wasn't even in his gather yet. No. He caught Bub as he's dribbling the. It's ridiculous. It's literally like. He's like just inside burst. the three point line. Yeah, it, that kind of burst only Amen has. Again, that's why Amen can do. One of one things. And I'm slowly, like, I, I hope that Sengun continues to get better, man. I just, like, I kind of cringe watching Sengun sometimes, man. Like, legitimately. Like, when he does that goofy, dumbass, one-legged fadeaway where it's not even contested, I'm like, bro, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you are purposely throwing yourself off balance. I don't care if you practice that shot. I don't know, man. Sengun's frustrating. Both of them are frustrating sometimes. Green, Green and Sengun are both flawed basketball players. Like, Jalen mm -hmm. Green is brainless. And so is Sengun sometimes, man. They they make me mad. They make me really mad watching them sometimes. But Houston's deep, and they've got a ton of athletic, defensive-minded guys. I would, though. I don't really think Dylan Brooks brings a ton of... I don't think he brings more value than Tari Eason. I'll no. just say it like that. Yeah, like, Tari's I think Tari's a, a better basketball player. And I think Amen, on the whole, with what he can do, is a better basketball player, too. I think that defenses respect Dylan a little bit more, but Dylan can also be brainless, and Dylan's only going to hit 30% of his threes. I'd rather have a one-of-one -one freak athlete out there like Amen. And I'd rather have a guy like Tari Eason. I think Tari mm -hmm. just plays better basketball. So, you know what, man? The Rockets are in a good spot. They're like a spoil of of riches at this point mm -hmm. you have a lot of good wings that you can turn to but yeah, i said bench dylan brooks last time and i'm obviously biased because i hate dylan brooks i think a lot of people hate dylan brooks but but not for um, bad reasons not just because he sucks you know <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't suck he's a hell of a defender still but he's tough offensively and like 
Dari's just really good, man. I'm just never – Dylan completely lost me when he poked the bear. With LeBron? W- with LeBron. Yeah. And then LeBron sunned his ass as he that earned. Was silly. Like, that's when I lost. I was like, you're an idiot. That's when I realized Dylan Brooks oh, he is a complete is. buffoon. He's definitely an idiot. He does still work his ass off defensively, though. But the only – thing that like is tough for a man is that like he has to play with shangun you know and listen let's not say that there's a ton of stretch fives out there but like there are a number of them and shangun is not one of them and it is a little tough when a man is still a total non-shooter so long term i know that they extended shangun a man permanent small ball five bro well, it doesn't have to be that, but, like, maybe really try to find a big who can protect the rim and space the floor. And, like, I do want to give some credit to Shangun because he's been a more functional defensive player than I thought he would have been able to be. He's certainly not the strength of this defense, but, like, he's he's doing his job out there, basically. But I'm just not sure that he has the skill set that this team needs if they want to max out their ceiling. And, I mean, that's part of the beauty of this all, right? They have so many assets who are appealing to different teams depending on their situations. Like, they can mix and match, and they can build the team that they think is the best combination of talent and fit. All I know is a men Thompson better be part of that group because he's going to be a star. And Tari Eason better be part of that group because he is a winner, and he's a rare kind of winner for being this young. I think, like, every year of his career, and he didn't play that much last year because he got hurt, but, like, He's got ridiculous on-off numbers. It's plus 13 this year, I know. I think it was, like, the same his rookie year. And he's just gotten better. So, shout-out to those guys. I'll give one super, super quick shout-out to the Detroit Pistons because I think that they're going to be in the play-in in the East, which is a very low bar. But I feel like we've heard a lot more about, like, Charlotte, right? People getting excited about them. I think Detroit's better. I like – speaking of young guys, I really like what I've seen from Jaden Ivey this year, too. I agree. I've been impressed by Jaden Ivey. I've been impressed by Cade, who I've always really liked. But he's playing better offensively. We've really seen him buy in defensively, though. And I think that he's always had the tools there. Now he's in a situation where it's like, all right, lock in and actually defend. And – He's big, he's strong, he's a good shot-blocking guard, he moves his feet well. That's really the difference with Detroit. I mean, they've gotten better offensively for sure, and their spacing's gotten better. They've brought in actual grown men basketball players. All that's big. They're also just, like, way more engaged defensively, and they're really competing defensively, and they're just a much more serious basketball team. So I do like them. I think that they deserve a shout-out as well. Any final thoughts, Logan, before we sign off? As Darvin like Ham would say, salute. <laughs> Damn. Do you like uh do you like Detroit more than Chicago? I don't like anything about Chicago. Hey, fair. Neither do I. I like Kobe White and Tassoon mood. That's about it. You're right. I shouldn't say that I don't like anything about Chicago. Yeah, I'm taking Detroit. I'm taking Atlanta and Detroit as my nine ten playing teams. I think I'm with you. I think I'm with you. I like them, man. I like what we're seeing from Detroit. And thank God, bro, they needed it more than anybody else. All right, guys, appreciate you tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, as always, there's plenty more Nerd Sesh content. You can watch all of our full shows on our YouTube channel. We uh, did a full NFL reaction on Sunday. You can catch up with that. We've got tons of NBA content. I mentioned I did a video on Jokic, the incredible season he's having last week. Also did a video on Evan Mobley. There will be more videos like that coming as the year goes along so you can stay locked in for all that you can follow us across social tiktok instagram at nerd sesh in uh twitter at nerd underscore sesh to see clips from the show graphics from the show all of our trivia content and we're doing some original take content there i actually talked about lebron and mj why my perspective has changed on the goat debate i uh read off a lot of the numbers that we talked about with Jokic today in a video about why I do think he's having the best offensive season ever. So you can follow us across all those spots for some more bite-sized takes. And you can listen to all the full shows across audio platforms. You can also check out our merch. That's linked in our link tree across our social media bios. That is at Breaking Tea now. And you can join our Discord if you want to chat with the gang. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. I've been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash.